logical argument for God's existence argues for the existence of a maximally great being using modal logic. For those not familiar with the ontological argument, I have already made a video introducing the argument's basic premises and terminology employed in the argument, terms like possible worlds and a maximally great being. As you probably know, the argument attempts to show that the mere possible instantiation of God logically entails that God, aka a maximally great being, actually exists. If God is possible, God is actual. However, even if God isn't even logically possible, then the argument fails from the start. Some skeptics have raised several objections concerning the coherence of a maximally great being. These types of incoherent arguments to a maximally great being are known in the philosophical literature as the omnipotence paradox, the omniscience paradox, and the omnipresence paradox, and the omnibenevolence paradox, respectively. In this video, I'd like to respond to three objections to the concept of a maximally great being. These objections typically show that one of the superlative attributes of God, the omni attributes, are incoherent either when taken in isolation or when put together. So fire up those neurons because we're about to use the brains that God gave us. The first objection is the omnipotence paradox. Atheists say that the concept of omnipotence is logically incoherent. Lay atheists usually pose the problem in the form of a riddle. Can God create a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it? However you answer this question, you imply that God is not omnipotent. If you say yes, that God can create a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it, then there is something God cannot do, namely lift or move the rock that he created. If you answer no, then there's something God cannot do, namely create a rock too heavy for him to move. Whether you answer yes or no, it means that God cannot do anything, and if God cannot do anything, then that means that God is not omnipotent. And if God is not omnipotent, then God is not maximally great, since a maximally great being is omnipotent by definition. Therefore, a maximally great being is an incoherent concept, and therefore the ontological argument is fallacious. How should Christians respond to this objection? Well, first I would take issue with the underlying presupposition that the skeptic has. The skeptic is presupposing a particular definition of the word omnipotent. The objector is presupposing that when a person says God is omnipotent, that means that he can just do anything. It's understandable that skeptics have this presupposition since many Christians do say things like God can do anything and all things are possible with God when talking about his omnipotence. Even Jesus said that with God nothing is impossible in Matthew 19.26. However, many philosophers of religion and theologians widely hold that omnipotence is properly defined as being able to do anything that is logically possible. If this is the correct definition of omnipotence, then no problem exists. There are some things God cannot do because they violate the laws of logic. God cannot create a square circle, a married bachelor, or a one-ended stick. God cannot make himself cease to exist, and God cannot create a rock too heavy for him to lift. God can do all things that are logically possible, but he cannot do things that are logically impossible. Now, I need to make it very clear by what I mean when I say logically possible. Many Christians object that this is putting God in a box and that God is not obligated to make sense to us. What I am not saying is that God is constrained to do things that make sense to our human minds. We may not be able to make sense out of why God would allow a particular evil to occur, or how God can create the entire universe out of nothing, or why God would institute a particular law in the Torah. I'm not denying that God's ways can sometimes be mysterious to us. Rather, what I'm saying is that God cannot do anything that violates the law of non-contradiction, the law of identity, or the law of excluded middle. God cannot actualize contradictory states of affairs. 
creating the universe out of nothing, making the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead come back to life, and so on, may be inexplicable to us, but they don't violate the laws of logic as philosophers define them. So the omnipotence paradox is founded on a false premise. Asking, can God create a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it, is tantamount to saying, can God's infinite power overwhelm his infinite power? Or can God beat himself in a fist fight? Or can God think up a mathematical equation too difficult for him to solve? It's sheer nonsense. C.S. Lewis addressed the problem well when he wrote, quote, his omnipotence means power to do all that is intrinsically possible, not to do the intrinsically impossible. You may attribute miracles to him, but not nonsense. This is no limit to his power. Meaningless combinations of words do not suddenly acquire meaning simply because we prefix to them the two other words, God can. It remains true that all things are possible with God. The intrinsic impossibilities are not things, but non-entities. It is no more possible for God than for the weakest of his creatures to carry out both of two mutually exclusive alternatives, not because his power meets an obstacle, but because nonsense remains nonsense even when we talk it about God." End quote. You're basically asking if a being of unlimited power can produce something to limit himself. But his unlimited power, by definition, rules out that possibility. An unlimited being cannot create limits for himself. It is contradictory to posit that a limited, unlimited being exists. Can God create a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it? No. Why? God's omnipotence prohibits him from creating a rock too heavy for him to lift. It's because God is all-powerful that any rock of any size and any weight is going to be movable for him. I think the correct definition is the one most commonly accepted by theologians and theistic philosophers. God can do anything so long as it is logically possible. At this point, atheists have usually accused me of redefining omnipotence ad hoc to save theism. But this is not a valid response. This is how philosophers of religion and theologians have divined omnipotence for centuries. I've already pointed to C.S. Lewis writing in the 1950s, but there are other prominent historical theologians who have defined omnipotence in this way. St. Augustine wrote in his book, The City of God, in about 426 AD that, quote, But assuredly, he is rightly called omnipotent, though he can neither die nor fall into error. For he is called omnipotent on account of his doing what he wills, not on account of his suffering what he wills not. For if that should befall him, he would be by no means omnipotent. Wherefore, he cannot do some things for the very reason that he is omnipotent." End quote. Augustine wrote his book somewhere between 413 and 426 AD, according to Britannica.com. So, this definition of God only being able to do what is logically possible is not some ad hoc thing that I or other modern-day Christian apologists have just made up to try to save the coherence of the concept of God. Christians have been defining omnipotence this way for centuries, as far back as Augustine writing in the 400s. Terms like square circle, one-ended stick, married bachelor, these are just meaningless combinations of words that are stuck together. Um, saying that God can create them is... it's absurd, and God's omnipotence is not undermined by saying that he cannot create a rock too heavy for him to lift or a square circle any more than saying that God's omniscience is undermined because he's unable to answer the question If I ate a square circle, would a married bachelor murder me with a shapeless object? These are just meaningless English words that are strung together. They don't have any referent. In conclusion, if omnipotence is defined as being able to do anything that's logically possible, then the omnipotence paradox fails.
If the skeptic insists on omnipotence being defined as doing the logically impossible, then he's got to show that being able to actualize incoherent states of affairs is necessary for a maximally great being to be maximally great. However, I think that we could ar easily argue that rationality is a great making property just as much as omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, and necessary existence and moral perfection. It's better to be a rational being than to be an irrational being. I would argue that if God were irrational, that he would not be maximally great. He, and he would indeed be irrational if he went about creating square circles, married bachelors, and rocks too heavy for him to lift. Thus, even if God's power, even if God's power granted him to create logically incoherent states of affairs, I think his rational nature would still prevent him from doing so. So I don't think the omnipotence paradox succeeds in undermining the ontological argument and showing that a maximally great being is incoherent. The omniscience paradox. The omniscience paradox comes in different forms. One form is to argue that God cannot be omniscient and morally perfect because if God knew everything, then he would know what it is like to sin. He would know the pleasure of a rapist when he rapes a woman. But if God knew these things, that would indicate that God is incredibly evil. After all, what kind of being would know what it is like to sin, and especially to take pleasure in sinning? God would even know what it was like for the Sanhedrins to sadistically rejoice in the crucifixion of Jesus. What kind of God knows feelings like this? Like with omnipotence, I think the skeptic is working, working with a skewed definition of omniscience. When it comes to knowledge, we can break them down into two categories. One, propositional knowledge, and two, experiential knowledge. The first kind of knowledge is simply an awareness of the facts. It is justified true belief in a given statement. For example, God would both know and believe the statement, the Sanhedrin took glee in watching Jesus suffer, and the rapist enjoyed raping his victim. Experiential knowledge is, as the name suggests, a knowledge of what it is like to experience something. We express this kind of knowledge when we say things like, I know how you feel, or I've been there, man. Now, does omniscience require both types of knowledge to be present in God's mind? I see no reason to think that it does. All that requires for God to be omniscient is for God to both know and believe all true propositions. If X is a true proposition, then God knows and believes X. For every X, if X is a fact, then God knows X. In other words, omniscience requires God to know things like the rapist enjoyed raping, but it doesn't require for him to know what it felt like to be the rapist doing the raping. God knows everything that could, would, and will happen, classified by Molinists like myself as God's natural, middle, and free knowledge. God knows and believes all propositions that are true. Unless the skeptic can provide me with a good reason to believe that omniscience requires more than exhaustive knowledge of true propositions, then I would assert that A, God does not know what it is like to sin, and that B, such a denial does not undermine his omniscience. A second form of the paradox also pits omnis God's omniscience against God's goodness. It argues that if God is omniscient, he therefore knows everything that will occur in the future. And if this is the case, then free will is impossible. Everything is fated by God to occur, by God's knowledge. But if everything is fated by God's knowledge to occur, then God, by his knowledge, causes evil to occur. And a good God would never cause evil to occur. The reason it is said that God's foreknowledge fates events to occur is that if the event that God foreknows were not to come to pass, then God would be wrong. God would be surprised. God wouldn't really have known what the future held. After all, knowledge is defined at minimum as justified true belief. Justified true belief. 
But if God foreknows X, and X doesn't come to pass, then it really wasn't a true belief. Maybe God was justified in believing it, but it wasn't true. This position is known in philosophical circles as fatalism. Usually the argument is cast in terms of a syllogism. 1. Necessarily, if God foreknows X, then X will occur. 2. God foreknows X. 3. Therefore, necessarily, X will occur. This seems to be a good argument, doesn't it? After all, both premises are true, at least I think they are. The reason I don't believe the conclusion, despite both premises being true, is that the argument is a non sequitur. The conclusion doesn't follow, even granted, the two premises. The syllogism commits what's called a modal fallacy. All that follows from these premises is that X will occur. All that follows from the two premises is that X will will occur. Not that X will necessarily occur. X could be different, and if it were different, then God's foreknowledge would be different. Let's say that little Billy chooses to stay inside and play video games on Saturday morning rather than going outside to play. Um, and from eternity past, God knew that on Saturday, January 5th, 2019 in the afternoon Billy will choose to play out uh, to play inside and play video games rather than going outside to play what if Billy exercised his freedom to go outside and play instead would God be caught by surprised would Billy have proven God wrong of course not Rather, if Billy made the decision to go outside and play, then God's foreknowledge would contain different propositional content. In this case, instead of foreknowing, Billy will choose to stay inside and play video games, God would have known instead that Billy will choose to play outside. If Billy chooses to stay inside and play video games next week, then that is what God foreknows. If Billy chooses to go outside and play, then that is what God foreknows. God foreknows X, and, necess and necessarily, if God foreknows X, then X will occur. But X could fail to occur. And if X were to fail to occur, then God would not foreknow X. God would foreknow not X instead. Our choices are logically prior to God's knowledge of them. God's knowledge of our choices is chrono chronologically prior to our choices, but our choices are logically prior to God's knowledge of them. Therefore, were the choices upon which God's knowledge is based to be different than what they are, God's knowledge would be different. This applies to both God's free knowledge, aka foreknowledge, as well as his middle knowledge of counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. Therefore, there is no incompatibility with saying God knows everything we would do in any circumstance we might find ourselves in, and yet we are free to do otherwise. In his Defenders class, Dr. William Lane Craig gives an excellent analogy. God knows in advance all of the choices that people will freely make, but that doesn't mean that he determines those choices. In fact, quite the opposite. If we want to speak of determination, it's the choices that determine what God foreknows, not vice versa. It's not that because God foreknows you will do something that you do it. It's because you will do it that God foreknows it. So if there's any determination going on here, it's the event that determines what God foreknows, not that what God foreknows determines the event. And in um, understanding this, I think it's very helpful to distinguish between two types of priority. Chronological priority which would be something being earlier in time. 
If something is chronologically prior to something else, it is earlier than it in time. And then logical priority, where something is explanatorily prior to something else. And these are not the same thing. Something can be logically prior to something else without being chronologically prior to it. And I think that's exactly what we have in the case of divine foreknowledge and the events foreknown by God. Chronologically, God's foreknowledge comes before the event. First God foreknows it, then the event occurs. So the foreknowledge is chronologically prior to the event foreknown. But logically, the event is prior to the foreknowledge. God's foreknowledge is what it is because the event is what it is. Um, it is because you will choose pizza for lunch that God foreknows it. It is not that you eat pizza for lunch because God foreknows it. That's to confuse chronological with logical priority. So as long as we understand that the object of God's foreknowledge is logically prior to what he foreknows, it doesn't really matter that God's foreknowledge is chronologically prior to the event foreknown. What that means is that if the event were to be different, then God's foreknowledge would be different. And those of you who have been with us the last few weeks will recognize there a subjunctive conditional, right? If the event were different, then God's foreknowledge would have been different. You will choose pizza for lunch, let's suppose. But you don't have to. You're free to choose something else. If you choose Panda Express instead, uh, then God will foreknow that. So if you were to choose Panda Express, God would have foreknown that instead of knowing that you will eat pizza for lunch today. So God's Foreknowledge tracks your choices like an infallible barometer. The barometer doesn't determine the weather, uh, even though chronologically the reading of the bar barometer may be first. The barometer infallibly tracks what the weather will be. In the same way, God's foreknowledge infallibly tracks your choices. Another analogy I like to give is an object and its shadow. Whichever the direction the object moves, that is where the object's shadow will be. If the object moves to the right, then that is where the object's shadow will be. If the object moves to the left, then that is where the object's shadow will be. If the object is over here, that's where the shadow is. If, that's, if the object's over here, then that is where the shadow is. The object is chronologically, or it's logically prior to the shadow. And whichever way the object moves, that's where the shadow will be. Likewise, whichever I, way I actualize my free will tomorrow, then that is what God w will predict will happen. If I choose to eat pizza for dinner tomorrow, then God will know Evan will eat pizza tomorrow. If I decide to have beef stew instead, then God would foreknow Evan will eat beef stew tomorrow instead. If you still don't see the point, let me use another analogy. Let's say you're a time traveler and you travel to the year 2050 to see who, the pr who will be the president that year. You come back to the current year and you tell your friends who the president will be in 2050. You and your friends now have foreknowledge of who will be president in 2050. Now, does your knowledge beforehand at all causally determine or fate who the president will be in 2050? No. The fact that of who the president will be caused your foreknowledge. Your foreknowledge did not cause who the president will be in 2050. The future doesn't cause your foreknowledge. Uh, the future events cause your foreknowledge. Your foreknowledge doesn't cause the future. There is another argument that tries to make God's omniscience incoherent, but in order to keep this video from being an hour long, I'll just refer you to a blog post that I wrote on the subject called Q&A, Is Omniscience a Self-Contradictory Concept? 
I'll leave a link to it in the description below. Let's move on to the next omni attribute of God that skeptics say are is incoherent. This one comes, I'm going to word the objection the way that Dan Barker uh, does in his book Godless. On page 128 of his book Godless, Dan Barker writes this, quote, Omnipresence is also a problem. To be present means for matter and or energy to occupy space-time at some spatial coordinates at a particular point in time. Technology extends our sense with machines, allowing viewers, for example, to be present at a televised event. But even this requires a physical connection. Camera, microphone, sense, receiver, speaker. Barker goes on to say, God is not present at every location in the universe, not in any ordinary sense. To say that God is present in a spiritual sense is meaningless unless spirit is defined. Since spirit is not normally described as something immaterial, or is normally described as something immaterial or transcendent, this means that being present spiritually is not to be present at all." End quote. Dan Barker has this notion that immaterial is synonymous with nothing. He presupposes his naturalistic worldview, his materialistic worldview, and basically says, if it's not material, it's not there. At the recent National Conference on Christian Apologetics, the Christian apologist and philosopher Kyle Keltz gives a really good response to Dan Barker. Um, okay, so omnipresence is probably the easiest one to talk about because it, it doesn't even have to flow from the arguments for God's existence. I mean, it does, but omnipresence is something that just flows from believing that God is all powerful and all knowing, right? Um, since God is upholding and sustaining the universe in existence, uh, he must, you know, be om uh, omnipotent. He must be all knowing. Uh, but what we mean when we say that God is omnipresent, obviously crit monotheists uh, from day one have believed that God is immaterial. So what is it? How could it, you know, and this is something I had issues with when I was younger. How could God be said to be omnipresent? You know, he's a spirit. He's, he's not anywhere, right? He's transcendent. He, uh, monotheists even, even uh, admit that he's not in the universe physically. So how could he be present anywhere? Well, if God knows every inch of creation, right, because God's because they already Aquinas would already reason that God is omniscient because his his knowledge is, is what's even it's one of the causes of why there's anything because God knows everything. And that's how he's causing it to exist at each moment. He knows every hair on our head. Right. Like the Bible says, he, he knows every inch of creation. So just like I know what's happening in a football game when I watch it on TV. So also he knows everything that's happening at every second in every location in the universe through his infinite knowledge. So that's so just like we would say I'm present at a football game when I watch it on TV, we say that he's present everywhere in his knowledge. We also say that he, because his power is what's upholding everything in existence. Also, his power is everywhere in the universe. So we're saying he's basically present in every place in the universe through his knowledge and power. And that is not a meaningless thing to say. It means something, right? And it's not just because it's like, just because I can't hold something in existence <laughs> and know every inch of it when, and hold it together with just my will and power doesn't mean that I can't know what this means for God to be present in these ways. In a nutshell, B. Kyle Kelt says that God's omnipresence logically flows out of both his omnipotence and his omniscience. God is God's power extends to every place in creation, and God knows about every inch of creation. So God has the God knows about every inch of creation. He's he has the power to cause effects at every inch of creation. And so the om the omnipotence of God and the omniscience of God combined logically entail omnipresence. He's present everywhere in his power and his knowledge. Dr. William Lane Craig has said the same thing and said that this is a more adequate explanation of, uh, of, or way of thinking about God's om omnipresence rather than thinking of him as 
sort of like an ether gas spread throughout the universe. Now there's another objection uh, to the coherence of God's omnibenevolence. It has to do, it's basically the logical version of the problem of evil. And because I, ha I plan on making a whole video dedicated to the problem of evil alone, I'm not going to address it in this video. But if you can't wait until then, I've already got some written material on my website, www.cerebralfaith.net, on the problem of evil. Both the logical version and the evidential version, and I also have a few podcast episodes about the problem of evil. So anyway, thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, punch that like button, like St. Nicholas punching Arius, and become a Cerebral Faith patron. Um, it's really, really helpful. Um, I've used every penny for ministry stuff. Paying for the website, paying for the stock footage, paying for the video editing software I'm using, paying for research material. It's really, I wouldn't be able to do it without you guys. And if you want to see more apologetic and theology content, subscribe and hit notifications. Until next time... Keep using the brains that God gave you.